everyone. Uh, today's lecture is about a really rich area of um, material science mixed with machine learning and other related data technologies, uh, which is chemoinformatics. And I wanted to start off our practical uh, discussion of different kinds of techniques for using supervised learning or other data tools along with um, materials or chemistry data with chemoinformatics because it's one of the more richly studied areas uh, within this idea of how statistics can be a useful tool in uh, design or science in general. And to put that really into better context, the way that I want to introduce chemical informatics is by pointing out to the fact that it's closing in on 70 years of study. So leaving that point hanging for a moment, uh, the one thing that I haven't yet done is describe what I mean by chemical informatics or chemoinformatics. And this, kind of broadly described uh, by uh, Engel in 2003, is a mixture between uh, informatics techniques to solve chemical problems. So the one term in there that's likely unfamiliar to you is informatics. Informatics itself is a term that describes the intersection between uh, information technology, computing, statistics, machine learning, together with um, a scientific domain. So you might hear medical informatics or materials informatics. It's not uh, a term that one hears very often uh, these days. It's supplanted by uh, terms like data-driven or AI to describe such applications of statistics and computing. But given that this field has been around for a while, it's moniker formed uh, when the term informatics was more hip. And as I mentioned, there's an extremely long history uh, of this field. One of the early papers that's pointed to in this area is work in the early 1950s by Wiss Wesser on identifying how one can write out chemical substances for a computer. And this is a, a complicated problem in that names for some chemicals like ethanol require a bit of translation in order to be defined to a computer. I know uh, ethanol mean, or eth means that there are two carbons, all means that there's at least one um, uh, ox, or sorry, one alcohol group. And because I know that there's only one way to put that on an, an ethane two-link backbone, I can infer what the chemical structure is. And that line of logic is just too much for a computer. So there was a series of people that came up with these ways of running it out so that a computer could understand it and even coming up with challenges like how can I do it with the smallest number of symbols or how can I write out um, things in a way that when they're printed are unambiguous such as using the letter G for chlorine because C and L uh, can look ambiguous when typed together. And you can read this paper from the 50s and see nice gems like uh, they're using with a IBM scanning machinery, uh, which really uh, dates the article as being around at the advent of computing. And you can see elsewhere that the kind of problems that they were challenged or identifying were uh, or trying to solve were very much modern ones. Uh, they were trying to come up with a way of understanding toxicity, which in fact, I have colleagues at Argonne who have been doing just the same thing in 2020 to solve other modern problems like uh, poisoning due to PFAS and Teflon. So really all of this is to say that the history from chemoinformatics has goes back a long way and consequently a lot of the challenges that we're going to be talking about uh, in the class are things that uh, people have had a lot of chance to figure out how to solve. For example, uh, molecular descriptors are a very well studied area. There are many different kinds of discriminative representations, which, as we discussed in our last lecture, are ways that unambiguously and precisely define a structure, such as smile strings. We can encode something like ethanol as a simple line of characters, or inchy screen strings, which uh, share the uh, same goal as smiles, but do it in a way that ensures there's exactly one inchy string per uh, molecule, and you'll learn a little bit more about this uh, in our practical exercises. There are also fingerprints, which take a molecule and encode it as a quick reference of a fixed number of bits. 
and on the discriminative side, or sorry, the descriptive side of representations, uh, there's also just volumes of work on the subject. One of the textbooks that uh, kind of really hammers this home the best is from uh, 20 years ago, and it has over 140 pages of references describing the different ways you can uh, capture key features of a chemical uh, substance, such as constituent, constituental uh, descriptors like how many nitrogens are in a model, or ones that describe the structure like how much solvent accessible surface area is there, or things that require knowledge of the electronic structure such as statistics of the partial charges on each atom. And this I think really hits home the point that um, the kind of challenges that we're describing within uh, materials informatics or polymer informatics like we will in our course are really motivated by the pioneering work that's already been done in chemistry. Yeah, additionally, uh, besides ways of uh, being able to describe chemical substances, there's also 60 uh, years or nearly 60 years of using machine learning to identify uh, the key or to be able to predict the properties of molecules. This example here from the 1960s, I believe, is predicting the uh, carcinogenic or toxic, uh, or toxic properties of molecules. And the um, formula you see on the right, a linear regression model, is very much of the kind that you'll see in modern papers. And the general flow of this study where they created a resource of chemical data they had enough trust in to train statistical models on, or developing informative descriptors that can allow for training these kind of um, uh, simple models. And then finally, identifying the right statistical approaches for um, uh, being able to learn kind of robust and generalizable machine learning models. All of this is visible from 60 years ago, and as you can see at the top of this paper from the early 2000s, is very much the kind of science that's still done, and there's good reason for that. Uh, these methods are extremely well understood, and as you'll see by uh, many of the other uh, examples we'll come across in uh, our uh, lecture, are very well um, used for a reason. Simple machine learning models like this one that was only uh, trained on seven data points are really the only ways to go. You don't want to train a, a very complicated model in such a small data set. It also uh, works well if you have informative descriptors that let your models be interpretable. I didn't read this particular paper close enough to understand why using the uh, highest occupied molecular orbital energy uh, is the best thing to correlate with melting point. But presumably in this case, and if not, perhaps in many of the other ones, having a model with only two coefficients that uh, have values that are statistically meaningful, you can see very small uh, errors in the coefficients, uh, really lets you do kinds of science that isn't available with more complicated machine learning models. And then finally, this model uh, would be exceedingly uh, quick to compute as long as you had a uh, good source for getting the HOMO of a new molecule. So this is something you could easily scan billions of compounds with to quickly predict their melting temperatures. Another thing to point out is it's not just some of these isolated examples where um, supervised or simple like shallow learning techniques are still used. Uh, in fact, in a study from 2017, even on very established uh, uh, benchmarking problems, conventional machine learning methods can still do much better than their uh, deep learning or graph-based uh, neural networks uh, equivalents. In fact, uh, in this study, they found conventional machine learning was better for about a third of the tasks, and I think actually all of them within the biophysics domain. So there's still a lot of reason to uh, use conventional machine learning models. And if you look around at the work being done at uh, places like the NIH in their uh, collaborative center for toxology modeling, uh, you can use tools like Opera, uh, which 
is uh, a tool that combines many different um, machine learning models built from people around the world to predict some properties based on very high quality toxicity data set. So QSAR is something that you need to know about uh, depending on the kinds of problems that you're tackling, especially those with smaller data sets, but even as demonstrated by uh, uh, this work from uh, the Mallbench group, could, these kind of shallow learning models could still very well be uh, the right tool for a job. And considering that, uh, the one thing that I want to do to start teaching you the practical skills is to outline what are all the state-of-the-art tools that people use to tackle uh, these kind of QSAR problems. And we can start at the first level to note that there are just plentiful resources of chemical data available on the internet. There are tools like um, a Kimball that have over uh, some two million molecules within their databases, uh, broken out by different kinds of uh, challenge problems. The term uh, assay will describe a particular kind of test uh, used for these compounds. There are commercial sources like Chemicalize or UL that have compiled their own data sets. ULs is actually specific to that company's work within identifying uh, safety concerns within chemicals. And also resources like ChemSpider that are publicly available. Uh, ChemSpider was in fact started by uh, Anthony Williams uh, out of his garage. And uh, the story as he tells it, uh, he was running it for free at a server in his garage up until the point that it started interfering with his home internet, at which point um, public outcry demanded that he didn't turn it off, but instead it was picked up by the Royal Society of Chemistry in England. And it's now something that I actually find myself using uh, maybe a couple times a month, and I'm not even much of a chemical scientist. Uh, further, there are also many toolkits for being able to work with these kind of data and particularly build QSAR models. Uh, there are tools based in Java, like the Chemistry Development Kit, which is available on GitHub and open source. There's RD Kit, which you'll be using in our practical exercises that has nice interfaces with C++ and Python, and also commercial products. Uh, Code Informatics is a company that created the Dragon software, which provided the chemical descriptors used for many QSAR studies, and they've currently gone on to make a few new packages that are available commercially. So all of this is hopefully to say and reinforce the point that chemoinformatics is a mature field that there is a ton to learn from. There's, of course, 60 years of history that has produced many textbooks that are great for technical practitioners like handbooks with hundreds of pages of different molecular descriptors, and some introductory textbooks that I will probably be reading myself after finishing making these course materials, just with uh, the knowledge of how much it'll help me kind of understand the kinds of lessons uh, learned that are present uh, within such a lengthy history. Specifically on that point of lesson learned, uh, there's a great review paper from my colleague Tule at uh, RMIT in Melbourne uh, that goes over a lot of these different ways that people uh, can make mistakes building machine learning models on chemical data. And I'd encourage giving this a read, even if chemical informatics won't be an area that you work in as a scientist. So moving forward, um, the rest of what I'll encourage you to do after listening to this lecture is go onto our course GitHub and particularly try out the uh, chemoinformatics notebooks, uh, which will demonstrate how to use some of these tools. For example, how to manipulate chemical data with RDKit, or how to train conventional machine learning models using both descriptors, uh, the word in chemoinformatics for those descriptive um, features that capture kind of intuition about a molecule, and fingerprints, which are ways of quickly encoding a molecule such that we can quickly measure its similarity to others. So at that point, uh, that wraps up our uh, theory discussion for today, and I'll encourage you to go through our Jupyter notebooks.